you saw the very best players the entire country has to offer, and you saw it throughout the course of the weekend. He's growing, he's improving at such a rapid rate. He, he's going to be a very good player. This guy's a cross between Sean Marion and Lamar Odom. He's a six foot eight lefty, a high level athlete, but also got a little bit of point forward skills in him as he can handle and pass the ball extremely well. At this point, they are simply the standard by which everyone else is judged in prep school basketball. He's considering the likes of Michigan, North Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas. Welcome back to the Upside Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Finkelstein. And on this week's episode, we have Rhode Island head coach David Cox, who is coming off a very busy summer, not just uh, for reasons that everyone is going through with social justice reform and the coronavirus, but also because his roster went through quite a bit of turnover. And he certainly came out on top of that, rebuilding what should again be one of the top teams in the Atlantic 10. So, Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Adam. Absolutely. So, Coach, take me through this summer, because this had to be a lot on you emotionally, physically, I'm sure. I mean, how did have you had a chance to reflect on all this yet? Well, uh, the first thing is uh, I'm a true believer <laughs> and yeah. uh, God was definitely on my side. They say he doesn't give you more than you can handle. And uh, I was tested truly early in this pandemic, you know, with the departures. Um, you know, some of them were expected. You know, obviously a couple of them were unexpected. Uh, so that hit me hard. I mean, this was, you know, immediately at the conclusion of the season. And I say conclusion of the season, which which was obviously cut short due to the pandemic. Right. You know, we started to roll right into the, the transfer kind of situation. Um, but I, I got to give the staff a, a whole lot of credit for, you know, staying together, for doing a great job of evaluating, for, you know, getting me in front of some of these guys, at least virtually. And, uh, yeah, we were able to, uh, you know, uh, rebuild this roster uh, to something that we think is really strong and, and, and ready to compete for a championship this year. The uh, the best closer in the business, according to one of your assistants via text yesterday. So there. Uh, so now I, I got to say, because I, I know you probably won't phrase it like this, but is there a chance you're even better with with how everything shook out? But I mean, you, you got to feel really good with where you're at, especially with these guys automatic eligible right away. No, I do. I absolutely do. I mean, because we were able to get you know, really four really talented players, you know, and that's not counting Alan Batron, who was a very talented player, but who will sit out the transfer from Towson. But okay. the yep. other four guys, you know, they bring, tr you know, tremendous talent, uh, experience, college experience. Um, you know, they, they're just kind of like alphas as well, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what, that's kind of what we needed. My challenge, the staff's challenge will be blending, you know, all of this, all of this talent. But as you know, as a coach, you know, it's better to be in this situation than, than, than the other. Uh, so, no, I, I'm excited about what, what we've added. And we've been able to to actually work out for quite some time, Matt. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but, you know, our administration did a great job early in the pandemic of listening to me and my pleas to get my guys back here because of the pandemic and because yeah. of the civil unrest. We've got a lot of guys from, you know, inner cities, from D.C., right. Philadelphia, New York, and so on and so forth. So we were able to get them back relatively early, and they were here for almost two months, you know, prior to us even starting official workouts. Now, just for context from people listening, because I was aware, I was aware that you were kind of championing that cause of getting guys on campus earlier than was the norm, specifically for those reasons. But can you give some context? And, and it doesn't have to be player specific, sure. but about the, the challenges that your guys were facing at home and why it was important to get them to a place that I presume was was safe, first and foremost. That was right. the biggest uh, the biggest priority. Right. Well, 2020 has been a rough year, you know, obviously 2020 has been a rough year. And what it's brought with it is this virus, this pandemic that we've never experienced before, you know, a deadly pandemic that we can't see and that we don't know who, you know, who has. You have asymptomatic people. Uh, you have that issue. Uh, and then you have obviously the issue of, you know, all the civil unrest, you know, after the George Floyd incident, you know, there were protests and, you know, some violent protests and riots, you know, in a lot of inner cities. So, yes, my, you know, I was truly concerned about, you know, about our young men being entangled in, in one, if not both of those, both of those issues. So I just felt that this was a safe place. This would have been, you know, this was like a bubble for us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, we weren't allowed to obviously work them out or anything like that, but they were here, they were safe. So they were still taking their classes virtually. They were able to communicate virtually with, you know, uh, um, uh, the academic people uh, as well as communicating with us so we were just able to put them in a safe in a safe place they found basketball obviously the basketball players so they they found some some outlets and um you know it was really it was really it was really good for everybody they were able to bond as well which uh right which helps right 
Coach, um, there was a story done on you earlier, shortly after the George Floyd incident on CBS Sports about incidents you've had with with racial profiling. How is this, what has this been like as a black head coach with a team primarily of black players to, to lead young men of color through this time? Well, it's an awesome responsibility. Uh, I've told this story before. I'm not sure if I've told it to you, but you know, I grew up in Washington, DC. You know, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of my parents are Washington DC natives, you know, they grew mm -hmm. up through some of the civil unrest there in the sixties and the seventies, but I'd always, you know, uh, uh, watched Georgetown basketball. And I was a huge fan of John Thompson, you know, mm -hmm. RP John Thompson. Mm -hmm. And when I first got the job at, at, at Georgetown, I wasn't there a day or two before John big John, this is sat me down and a couple of other assistant coaches and told us what an awesome responsibility we had, you know, to lead young men, specifically African American young men. And, uh, you know, more about basketball it has to be more about basketball. It has to be about education and it has to be about building character, so on and so forth. So, you know, I take that challenge, that responsibility very, very seriously, very seriously. Mm -hmm. I'm a father myself, obviously. I've coached for over 20 years. Um, this is a way out for a lot of these young men. Um, uh, it's a way to uh, uh, further their education. So, I mean, there's so many great possibilities, you know, that they can possibly get to, you know, if they can kind of just stay the course uh, stay out of the way, but continue to educate themselves. And, uh, you know, that's those are many of the discussions that we've been having, honestly, over the last couple of months, just the importance of education, the importance of educating yourself, knowing your own history. Um, um, you know, it just makes you such, you know, it gives you more options. Uh, yeah. It makes you stronger as a as a person, you know, if you continue to strengthen that brain up there, you know, as well as, you know, your skills on the court and as well as all the muscles that you have. Mm. Using using basketball as a as a vehicle to a better life, I think is a, a principle that so many of us got into this yeah. initially to try and to try and help and support. But you were and and correct me if I'm wrong. You were an educator, and I know you probably view yourself as an educator now, as many coaches do. But you were very literally an educator before you were a coach, correct? Yes, I was. So I graduated from William and Mary with a master's in education in 1996, and I went. Right from graduation, basically, I think I graduated in, in, in August uh, with my master's program and started school in September. So my first job was at Archbishop Carroll High School. Yeah, as assistant dean of students. And then I spent three years there and then seven years at my alma mater, St. John's College High School, as the assistant principal. So, yeah, 10 years in secondary education. I, I, absolutely. That was my foundation. That was that was my love. I mean, I, I truly, you know, I, I think I grew as a person. I grew as a as a father. I grew as an educator, you know, in, in that environment. And as you mentioned, yes, I still do consider myself an, an educator. The court is now my classroom. These young men are, are, are my pupils and I take great pride in not only them winning on the floor, but winning off the floor as well. I, I uh, of course, what is an now, I know at the same time and again, correct me if I get any of this wrong, you were involved in the local basketball scene. Yeah. Uh, down in, in the D.C. area. There are, the, the D.C. area is known for the amount of talent that it produces. But one of the things that doesn't get as, as widely kind of talked about is the amount of coaches that have come out of that region. Yeah. Now, out of that group, you have um, what certainly seems to be an incredibly high degree of loyalty from people in that area because your ability to consistently recruit and land players, even up here in New England, is is just and and throughout your entire career whether it's georgetown rutgers anywhere else in between what is it about those relationships or your past that that makes those i don't know if loyalty is the right word but there's certainly a very uh clear relationship that that continues to go on year after year and it's not just one aau program which i think is the other part that makes it really unique because you see guys who are affiliated strong with one program or another but yours seems to be across the board with, with the entire region? Well, I've had a tremendous amount of support from a lot of individuals back in that DC area. Um, you know, again, I grew up in, in, in DC. I've got a, an older brother and an older sister as well. And, you know, again, I just spent my childhood. I played a lot of basketball. I played all, all over the city. I made, I made a lot of, a lot of good, you know, connections and, and, and good friendships. And, uh, I don't know. I, I think, Adam, I just I, I pride myself on, on being uh, a, a genuine person. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and and I, I do truly uh, appreciate all of the relationships uh, that I've established over over the years. And, uh, and I treasure those relationships. And I think one thing that that helped me early in the process, to be honest with you, and this might be, you know, 
one of those little uh, 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 101 classes for any upcoming assistant coaches, you know, I, I handled my losses well. You know, mm. I, I, I didn't always I didn't always get the players that I wanted. I mean, again, the first program that I coached for DC Assault for eight mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. the individuals that I coached, you know, for over 100 games were guys like Nolan Smith, Chris Wright, Michael Beasley, Dante Cunningham uh, and on and on. I, I, I didn't get any of those players. You know, my I, you know, I, I, my first job was at the University of Pittsburgh. Those guys were still in high school. You know, I, I didn't mm. get any of those players. Uh, Keith Stevens, who, who runs Team Takeover, who was, you know, I think, you know, one of the premier AU coaches, AAU coaches in the country. Recently uh, a guest on this podcast, actually. Uh, absolutely. He, yeah. You know, both he and I coached together with, with DC Assault. Uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, when he, he branched off, you know, I didn't necessarily get, you know, everybody that I tried to get from, from his program. But I think I handled those those losses well. I mean, you know, um, I, I didn't take it personal at, at all. I thank guys for the opportunity. I wish the young men well because I genuinely am a fan. And again, this is no disrespect to any other city or place in the country. But I, I love where I come from. I love the right. people. I know everything about the culture of D.C. I'm so appreciative of how it's helped mold me into a man. So I'm a true fan of these families as well as these young men, whether they choose me or not. You know, and sometimes I end up getting them on, on, on the back end. Case in point was Stan Robinson, who I recruited really hard while I was at Rutgers. I thought I was, you know, I was in. But, you know, Indiana came and scooped him. You know, great decision for him. Uh, but it didn't work out for him there. And then he ends up, you know, because of the relationship we maintained, you know, especially me and his family, he ends up coming here and he's here. He plays two years and he, we win two championships, you know. So uh, that, that's a big that's a big part of it, too. But just really grateful and thankful for all the support that I have gotten you know, a, as a coach from from the people in D.C. Well, you know, you talk about handling your losses well, and it seems like that now it's almost it's almost a recruiting strategy because people are so conscious of the transfer market. So it's it's almost not as it's almost more disingenuous than it used to be. You know, I mean, everybody now is, is so to hear about the guys who did it and did it for the right reasons early on before it was this this recruiting strategy and to see it kind of bear fruit at the end is it seems only fitting. You mentioned John Thompson um, as someone who coached at Georgetown and um, is from that area. What is what does that legacy mean to you? Uh, he's probably the, the one of the biggest reasons I'm here. I mean, uh, I've, I've got I've got to thank my, my parents, you know, and, and my immediate family, my wife and my kids for all the support that they've given me over the years. Obviously, I just thank the, the DMV family for for their support. But he was, you know, my father's always been my hero. But but John Thompson was kind of like my, my North Star in that regard. I knew that I wanted to coach at, at an early age, you know, and uh, to see, you know, a black man like that and Nolan Richardson and, and Cheney. You know, those yeah. are the guys that I grew up, you know, watching a uh, 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 coach. And specifically, John Thompson. I mean, I probably watched, you know, every game, you know, gr growing up through through the 80s and the, in the early 90s. And what he stood for, the character that he had, the resolve that he had, the, the, the passion that he had, the way he interacted, you know, with his players. You could feel the love, the genuine love, you know, mm -hmm. the way he interacted with, you know, with, with everybody else. He kind of kept them off balance. That was that was intentional. Yeah, you know, I just I don't know. Him, you know, he's an icon. And, yeah. uh, you know, he, he, he paved the way not only for me, obviously, but for every black head coach that you see right now in, in, in Division One one basketball. You know, we, we owe him and the other guys that I mentioned, you know, homage. Does the – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question, then I'm going to come back with some context. The question is, does the black coaches community today have the leadership that it did – when guys like you previously mentioned um, were were in the job. Um, and the reason I ask is because shortly after the George Floyd incident, we started to do a series of podcasts, do what we could in some small part to to increase the discussion. And that was something that I, I continued to hear. There's no, you know, th those shoes haven't been filled yet. We don't know who who next up. It's it's more of a by committee approach now than than it used to be. Um, and I, I'm just curious because I remember, you know, I've asked Jeff Capel this, I've asked Conzo Martin this, I've said, you know, other guys who are leaders in the community like yourself. And I've said, you know, is somebody in that role now? And, and so I'm just curious what your take is on that. No, nobody's in that role. It's, it's mm -hmm. nothing, nothing like, uh, at least what I hear it used to be. Again, I wasn't around, you know, 15, mm -hmm. 20 years ago as a head coach, but nothing like what I hear used to be. Plus we don't have necessarily the, you know, the, 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 
the leaders, the icons like the guys that I mentioned, whether it's mm. George Ravelin or Nolan Richardson or Chaney or John Thompson, you know, those guys were, were, were icons. And it's again, this is almost a microcosm of the country we're in right now. If you look at, you know, some of the political parties, you know, one of the political parties uh, is, is I think, you know, they ha we have the same we have the same issues there as well. And I won't get too mm. much into that. But yes, no, we don't have that. Uh, but I will say this, you know, there are individuals like you mentioned, the Kwanzo Martins of the world, you know, who's been, you know, a very, very outspoken, very well respected among, you know, the community of black head coaches, Leonard Hamilton as well. Mm -hmm. um, about a month or so ago, uh, and I'm not sure exactly whose idea, so I don't want to give, you know, I don't want to take sure. anybody's credit away, but I know that, you know, Tavares down there at Loyola and uh, uh, a number of other young coaches, Ashley Howard, you know, sure. they were, style, yeah, yeah of the style, they were first in on trying to get all of the black head coaches, you know, together in one room. And obviously we couldn't hmm. do that with the pandemic. So they started reaching out to all the black head coaches to see if we would be willing to do a call a month. And uh, and uh, we just finished our third call on, on, on Wednesday, our first call out of. And again, I'm, I don't know the exact numbers. Let's say they're 90, yeah. 96 black head coaches yeah. in the country, something like that. We had like 88 black head coaches on that. That was probably one of the most powerful calls that I have been a part of. I didn't say a word either. You know, I knew my I knew my place. You know, I didn't say a word. I just listened. Uh, but that was probably one of the most powerful calls. I mean, the unity, uh, um, the 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 winning tradition of a lot of those coaches. Uh, you could hear the character come out. You could hear the pain come out of some of those guys mm -hmm. when they started talking about some of the civil unrest. Uh, you know, it was just it was a powerful moment. And we've done that now three three times. So all that to say, I think we're on the right track. Mm. Uh, I think the first thing is we have to we have to be united and on the same page. Uh, 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 first of all, and that's not always been the case. It's not always been the case because of the landscape of this business. This is a very cutthroat. Competitive, yeah. yeah. It's a very competitive and cutthroat business. So as opposed to wishing each other well, you know, we were used to kind of stabbing each other in the back. But, you know, we, we, we had some really deep conversations just about that exactly in that first in that first meeting. And I think that was really powerful. And I think that we're heading in the right direction. I think our, our leader is, you know, or leaders are about to emerge from this powerful group, to be honest with you. Hmm. And that's not something that's hit the mainstream media yet. That, 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 uh, so that, that's exciting to hear that that's going on behind the scenes. Um, what is the, what's the message been to your kids? And by that, I mean your team. Um, you know, in this time and in these situations, do they have questions? Do they have, I mean, how, what's that dialogue been like? In regards to the pandemic or in regards to the civil unrest? Well, I meant it in regards to the civil unrest, but if and when they are associated or overlap at all, I don't want to pretend that that might not be an issue sure. either. So however you choose to, however the dialogue has presented itself. Sure. Well, obviously the, the, the pandemic has been, you know, uh, the talk since, since, you know, we were in New York city. Right. So we've had right. five, five straight months of, 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 of that talk. Okay. This yeah. thing is real. So getting these guys to understand that it's real, first of yeah. all, is, is a challenge. One, they're teenagers Two, they're, they're in college, you know, so they're, they're just, they're wired a little bit different socially than, yeah. th than yeah. you and I. And then right. we have, you know, some, some, some poor examples that have been presented throughout this nation, you know, over the last couple mm -hmm. of months, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's social distancing or masking and so on and so forth. So that, continued conversation dialogue is very very important to try to keep them safe and healthy and their family safe and healthy yeah in regards to the the to the civil unrest I, I i'll be honest with you here you know uh you know this is something that i've been you know on top of with my team you know uh my, my catalyst uh you know this is something that i've talked to to these young men again i, re I recruited when i recruit these young men i try to as best i can to get to know, know them genuinely and intimately, okay? Mm. And, and find out what moves them, you know, what motivates them, what gets them down, what obstacles they, they've had to, to kind of overcome. And we've got a lot of young men here who've had to battle some really tough family uh, uh, circumstances, whether it's because of, you know, social economics, whether it's because of where they, where they live, the environment, you know, uh, the educational opportunities that they've had. So, you know, uh, uh, and I, I've been very much aware of this, you know, my entire, you know, coaching or professional career. So sure. with my guys, this is something that we, we have constant dialogue about. What I have more recently uh, tried to focus on is educating our young men on our history, you know, mm. African-American history here in this country, not so that they can walk around 
angry, not so they can walk around with a an, an excuse in place, but so they know where they come from and they know how mm -hmm. powerful a people that they come from. You know, we talk about that all the time, whether we're talking about in Africa, you know, the kings and queens and the pyramids and the mathematicians, all the beautiful people, all of the powerful, all of the knowledgeable people, or our experiences obviously here in this country and the resolve that we've shown the mm -hmm. resolve that we've shown, you know, con getting through slavery, you know, and all of the other, you know, uh, uh, rules and laws that were put in place. Um, um, and, and obviously, many of them, unfortunately, still exist today, yeah. you know, uh, um, uh, but it's a constant conversation. We're just trying to educate. I'm trying to educate and empower, which is obviously, I think, something that you wanted to to talk about when you talked about, you know, connecting for change. Those are, you know, some yeah. of the pillars. I don't, yeah, wanna, I don't, I don't, I don't want to steal your stuff, but those. No, are no, no. That, you're you're doing exactly that, we, that. Yeah, those are things that we talk about all all the time. Educate yeah. yourself, then you can empower yourself. There's nothing more strong than this, right? There's nothing, nothing more powerful than that, and then you can eventually evolve and, and a lot of people not necessarily just our students but a lot of players but a lot of people need to educate themselves so that they can evolve and that's where we're at right now yeah no i that's beautifully said um the organization you just mentioned is comes directly from the atlantic 10. the atlantic 10 is a conference that has had much better uh representation among their head coaches and a lot of other conferences in the country Take us behind this new initiative, though, and 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 what it's going to mean for for the players and coaches in the league. Well, I'm going to try to do that as best I can because this wasn't an idea that came from the the commission's office or even the head coaches. The assistant coaches jumped on this right away. I've got, got to give credit where credit is due, and I don't want to start again mentioning names, but people that right. come to mind, you know, whether it's Kevin Sutton or Michael over at Fordham or Dwayne down there, George Mason, or I mean, there's just so many, or or Ricardo over at over at Dayton. I mean, these guys were Sean over at, at Bonnie's. These guys got together. They were passionate about the fact that we needed to do something about it. So they yeah. they jumped in and they actually began to dialogue almost daily. And then they put together something. They brought it to the head coaches just to kind of get us involved, get our feel for it. We weighed in on it. Then we took it to our ADs. And this thing is really, truly boring. how powerful you know, is it? Again, the three pillars, educate, empower, evolve, educate, empower, evolve. It's so powerful. Yeah, for sure. What is, um, are there tangible action items on the table for that group yet? Or is that still a work in progress? It's still a work in progress, but we, we did just have a call uh, uh, just last week and they brought up uh, a, a number of things, you know, in, in regards to an action plan. Uh, one of the things that they that they mentioned that, you know, every school we're responsible for doing is bringing in four speakers throughout the year, you know, to talk to our young men uh, uh, about uh, uh, the history of African-Americans here. I mean, this mm. is purely based around, you know, uh, African-Americans right now. So the sure. history of African-Americans here, uh, 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 the legacies of, of, of great pioneers in African-American history, which we don't learn anything about. We're trying to educate ourselves. So that that's yeah. the that's the first the first step. Then I know they we had talked about um, getting these young men involved, at least one representative from each team, uh, a true internship in the summer. Uh, but because of the pandemic, you know, we can't go to places like New York or Atlanta and things like that, or even D.C. So we all kind of, you know, agreed to do it locally, find mm. you know uh, uh, an avenue for them to get uh, an internship and something powerful too, something that's going to educate them, something that's going to uplift them, things of that nature. So we're still at the preliminary stage, but I know that they've thrown those things out there. That was that was something that was at the forefront of what uh, Conzo Martin talked to us about when he was on this podcast earlier. We talked about, you know, what change could really look like as people continue to evolve. And and he was really advocating for helping guys who, you know, may not play professionally or maybe when they're done playing professionally, find an entry into the job market so that it's about more than just increasing value for the university when you're wearing the uniform and bouncing the ball. But it, it's really a, an, an avenue towards a, a better life. Absolutely. And um, and and he was, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting. He talked about even facilitating um, uh, jobs, even in the local police department, from mm -hmm. from his guys and, and in the communities they come from. So I thought that was, I, I thought those things, you know, because I think everybody right now is committed to getting uh, their their players to voting and 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 hopefully to educating them um, about candidates and 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 uh, certain political beliefs regardless of whatever you know th they may be because even within the same parties people can have different viewpoints 
Um, but it's, it's, I think one of the things that differentiates what we're seeing in the Atlantic 10 right now is the action items are potentially going beyond that when you talk about the speakers and the internships and uh, leads to you know job placement, which I, I think could really, really be a, uh, a huge, huge Absolutely. step in the right direction. Absolutely. Big shout out to Kwanzo, who is, you know, one of my, you know, uh, and we're not that far apart in age, but he's been one of my idols, you know, since he was since he was uh, starting as an assistant coach. So I, I've watched him. I've watched his career. I've loved his coaching style. But more importantly, as you just mentioned, his character, the way he, you know, uh, the things that he talks about, the things that are important to him, you know, should be important to all to all head coaches. And we need, you know, uh, we need his voice and we need people like him, you know, to continue to, to, to lead us. And he's, he's absolutely right. It's very important that we make sure that these young men, particularly those who, you know, not all of them are going to go play professional basketball, right. you know, are, 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 are set. Or, or at least, mm. you know, on the right on the right path. And we have a lot, you know, uh, a huge role to, to, to play in that. And I'm glad you mentioned the, you know, the, the police thing. Absolutely. You know, representation and a lot of these, you know, uh, uh, police precincts, you know, uh, are, are very important uh, mm. uh, for, you know, uh, um, the communities to kind of come back together. Mm. Coach, the uh, one I appreciate your candor being willing to discuss those topics. I want to ask you about the the. Um, big news in the last week, not just within the Atlantic 10, but obviously now college basketball coming back. Um, we have a start date. Now that's kind of the macro. I think the micro is now going to fall on the individual conferences and the institutions themselves to decide how that's going to roll out on, on their terms. I, I wouldn't, I, I still would not be surprised if there are some division one institutions, I'm sure you guys won't be one of them, that maybe don't play. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility if they can't live up to testing protocols, if there's resource issues. But what is that, now that kind of that first domino has fallen, what does that process look like at Rhode Island and then the Atlantic 10? Does, does stuff have to filter down from the conference first? Absolutely. Well, the first thing was, as you mentioned, we got the, the notification or the decision made by the NCAA that we can start the season. Like there, there now is a, there's a target date. So deep side, deep, you know, deep right. breath right there. That, that, that feels good. And then quickly, you know, you turn and you're getting punched again because now, obviously, we've got all sorts of scheduling issues. Yes, this yeah. is going to be dictated by, by the Power Fives. It, it depends on whether or not they're going to be, you know, willing to play these non-conference games or they're going to bunker down into a bubble and just play themselves in conference play. That That is, we're going to have to wait for their decisions. You know, obviously, those are huge games for, for us here in the A-10. Those are, you know, those are games that can kind of, you know, early in the season make or break our, our NCAA chances. And uh, we'll not necessarily break them, but they give us a great opportunity at, at making mm. the tournament. So, you know, th those are really, really important games. We're, we're, we're obviously hoping for the best. We've got a, a slate of Power 5 games in our non-conference this year that are, that'll be just as tough, just as challenging a, as last year. And we obviously, we look, we look forward to those challenges. So it's kind of a, we're in wait and see mode right now. Gotcha. And now, I talk about the team in particular. We mentioned this earlier, but what is the stylistically, what do you anticipate the the complexion of the team to look look like this year? Obviously Fats is back, but you got a lot of size up front now. And and not just up front, but positional size across the 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 entire lineup, along with a really big little guy, if I could uh do that contradiction. So how does how do you foresee all that kind of shaking out? Well, we, we've always, you know, uh, relied heavily on, on, on our defense here and that, mm -hmm. that, that, that won't change. But what we should be able to do this year, as opposed to the last couple of years, because we've been limited with our, our depth is uh, apply a lot more full court pressure, you mm. know, perhaps, you know, trap all over the floor, you know, like so we want to be relentless, relentless with our pressure. You know, we have we have the athletes, we, we have the depth, we have the, the, the size. We should have the speed, you know, and the quickness to be able to do that. Uh, so so I think that'll probably be. Our, our main difference other than that offensively we want to still play with tremendous pace as you mentioned we you know we've got some big guys now some guys that can kind of put the ball in the basket uh so you know we'll, we'll continue to play through those guys in our, our low post offense uh but but outside of that you know the offensive philosophy probably won't change much defensively we're going to get after it we're going to get into people we'll be really physical we'll try to harass and, and deflect and pester and and prod uh but the full court you know display of of, of defensive pressure should be something that's uh uh, exciting for everybody to watch. Coach, I usually like to wrap up these interviews by by digging into uh, some kind of digging into the weeds a little bit, finding finding out what you know if there's a something I I can take away from from these coaches. 
uh, one of the questions I like to ask, ask is about books and books you may read that's helped you grow or, or uh, and, and I don't want to assume that not everybody's a big reader. Bob Huggins actually made fun of me for that question. That was good. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, whether it's a book, maybe it's a movie that you've drawn inspiration from, a podcast that you learned from, any resources like that that have, that have really been impactful or powerful for you? Well, to be honest with you right now, I've been kind of locked into this is going to sound so just locked into the the news the daily mm. the daily news so I, I i think for that's for, depressing yeah no it, it is depressing <laughs> but but i think that for for me to be able to effectively communicate to our guys you know the importance of voting the importance yeah. of continuing to educate yourself so that you're not in a, a position of helplessness in another mm. 10 or 15 years you know i've got to know exactly what's going on on a daily basis i've got to know the political landscape i've got to know what's going on in some of these these inner cities i've got to know what's going on with the virus i got to know what's going on with the wildfires all those things as well yeah. you yeah. know but I, i've got to be on top of it so you know we, we have a lot of discussions honestly about about the daily and in, in mm. regards to something that 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 we as a team have been reading i don't know if i can throw this up here yeah. um we've been reading this lately as a team and, and it's not a book, okay? It's more of a pamphlet because, you know, sometimes our guys might struggle keeping their concentration, <laughs> sure. reading, reading something a little bit too long. Sometimes I might, yeah. Yeah, this right here is, is kind of sums it up, right? 401 years summed up in 60 historical facts, connecting the very first 20 slaves to the death of George Floyd. So basically, oh, wow. so basically, you know, you start, you start from the beginning the first the, the first thing you show here is 1619 right that's where we started where 20 africans came here and we've gone through this you know we're going through the history of us here and the and it's amazing it's amazing <laughs> you know some things that you kind of take for granted that a young man w w would know you know whether like you know who was in the civil war or why yeah. was the civil war fought you know that, that not everybody has a grasp of that so we we're starting here with the found the foundational the foundational levels just making sure they know again their history where they come from all of the things that we as a people have had to overcome you know and, and i'm trying to do that to encourage them to let them know again how strong how right. how powerful how intelligent you know that they truly truly are because a lot of our guys don't hear that all the time yeah yeah that is that is powerful stuff i think that's i can only speak for myself that's one of the things that that i've really taken away um not just since george is a journey because of of friends of mine that i've i started to go on a few months before george floyd but learning even the 20th century history with redlining and stuff like that that Absolutely. is just, um, you know, Tulsa race massacre, stuff that, that's not taught in, in the public schools at, or in any schools for the most part, um, right. but just really a really important part of our history. So that that's is, right. um, that you've is got a, uh, you've got you got gentrification in cities, you've got redlining, you've got you know, you've got all sorts of current, like I said, current day, you know, issues. Again, we're not going to I'm not going to dare call this, you know, necessarily modern day slavery, but there are still obviously, you know, a lot of the pitfalls still exist and we, we we have to continue to talk about those things educate ourselves on address them and and build from there the biggest I, I know i'll just mention one more thing that that when i read i was like are you serious like the the stuff coming out of world war ii with the new deal and the implicate i mean those implications of of um the systemic racism in those policies are very visible today um and that's so so that's that's Powerful, powerful stuff. I'd love to uh, love to read that myself, actually. Absolutely. Coach, it's, um, I've monopolized enough of your time here. I appreciate your, your time and your candor as always. I know roadie fans are very excited for the coming year uh, with another loaded roster coming up, but you are obviously doing uh, potentially even more important work with your young men right now. So thank you for taking the time to, to share with us. Absolutely. I appreciate that. I appreciate the platform too. Thanks a lot.